without further ado, uh, the infamous uh, Jim Riswold. Well, I'm going to tell a story about Duke first. Duke and I used to play hockey together. So did Wojo here. Duke and Wojo are very good hockey players. I am not. I was a lousy goalie. This is my best move as a goalie. <laughs> I always knew where the puck was. It was behind me. We were a very good team because of people like Duke and Wojo. I have a shutout going against the second best team in the league, the Portland Police Department hockey team. <laughs> shutout. I'm living on cloud nine. 30 seconds to go. My own team, led by Duke, scores on me. So I don't get a shutout. So that should, you know, Duke comes up and talks about, oh, how wonderful the do is, and all this hippie bullshit that he talks about. That's the kind of Duke that I know. <laughs> Two other things before I start. This presentation includes what David tells me is a record, 54 slides for a due lecture. Take that, Ann. You may go to the North Pole. I got 54 <laughs> frickin' slides. And I start with a question. What? 54 is more than 50. <laughs> Does everybody know who Millard Fillmore was? Yes, 13th President of the United States. It, this knowledge will come in handy at some time during this speech, which I'm told by David too. This is the only speech in the history of Dew that comes with a warning label. <clears throat> and I thought this was gonna, and I am not a public speaker. I'm a storyteller, so I'm scared shitless. <laughs> I ever, nobody had notes, and here I am, stack of trees <laughs> at a green <laughs> conference. <laughs> but anyway, I did think this was going to be an easy talk. I was going to talk about getting leukemia in 2000 and being told I had two to four years to live. That's not a good thing to hear when you're 42 years old. <clears throat> then I was going to talk about how after my diagnosis, I retired from Wyden and Kennedy after 22 years because I didn't want, here lies the guy that did that bow nose commercial on my tombstone and jumped into the art world as a self-proclaimed fake artist. Or as I like to say, I went from a career of selling things that people don't need to making things that people don't want. <laughs> <laughs> and I was gonna talk about how it didn't matter if I sucked as a fake artist. I had fucking leukemia. I had a good chance of being dead before their mean words could hurt my feelings. And as I've done before, I was gonna talk about how this man, Adolf Hitler, saved my life. Yes, of course, the least nice man in history had significant help from the incredibly nice Brian Drucker and a medicine he invented called Gleevec. Does everybody know what this medicine is? It's the first targeted cancer therapy developed specifically for a particular form of leukemia that I was fortunate enough, if you can say it was fortunate, to have. And Brian was fortunate enough, was nice enough to live in the same city as I did. So I met him and he saved my life, along with Adolf. Yes, I know that Hitler makes an unlikely savior and as such raises pesky ethical questions. But this was art and the Fuhrer and a few of his cronies responsible for World War II and all its attendant unpleasantness formed the basis of my first show in 2005 called Goring's Lunch. It featured such questionably, uh, such pieces of questionable taste such as the Hitler Mobile, Goring's Lunch, Himmler's Homework, Gerbel's Chair, Heydrich's Skateboard, <laughs> Rome's Roses, and many offensive others. Willamette Week, the local arts 
magazine named it one of the best shows of 2005. The Hitler Mobile and Rome's Roses were selected for the 2006 Northwest Biennial. My son and daughter's school asked me to, quote, do something like my Hitler art, but without Hitler, to help raise money for their school. Not everyone was pleased. At the opening of Goring's lunch, someone asked my beautiful daughter, Hallie, told my daughter, your dad has some serious issues. Someone else said he was gonna buy the entire show so he could burn it. And that person was a friend. <laughs> the Northwest Biennial received so many complaints about my work, they had to hand, it, oops, hand employees talking points about my art. I offered to come up to Tacoma and cover them with Hello Kitty stickers. <laughs> but it was a good story, or at least Esquire thought so. They published it in 2005. Again, not everyone was pleased. Two advertisers in the issue asked for their money back. I went on to make more shows about history's bullies, such as Napoleon in a show called Napoleon 1769 to 2005. It features such pieces of Le Chapeau de Napoleon, Napoleon Ganja à la Paradis. French thought he went to heaven. I did a show called Mile Home and Garden. <laughs> Featured such pieces as Heart Cone Chairman Mao. Get it? <laughs> Chicken and corn on the cob and pie and Mao. <laughs> Will you be my Valentine, Chairman Mao? I did another show called Bad People Have to Eat Too. Featured Kim Jong-il as a big sucker. <laughs> Small Caesar salad. Do you know that the Caesar... <laughs> you know, on aside, the Caesar salad is not named after Julius Caesar. It's name named after Caesar Kandari. But there is a joke about the Caesar salad featuring... Uh, a joke featuring... Caesar and his salad. His cook brings him a salad made of anchovy, Worcestershire, coddled eggs, romaine lettuce, ch Parmesan cheese, the ingredients of the modern Caesar salad. And he brings it to him, he goes, you shall name this salad emperor. And Caesar goes, I name it Coleslaw. <laughs> there are no jokes about Caesar Kandari. <clears throat> uh, then another show. Oh, there's Adolf and Ava's wedding cake. <laughs> Outside of taste, can somebody tell me what's wrong with this? <laughs> it's in English. <laughs> <laughs> Did a show called Marie Antoinette's Head and Others. It says, coupe which cut here in French, Marie Antoinette after, and Marie Antoinette's head. Anyway, I call my work absurd realism. Others call it perverse whimsy. One other person call it a black hole sucking the life out of everything. <laughs> but a really smart philosophy professor said my work teaches us how to deal with monsters, be it a Hitler or a deadly disease. Or my mom, as my mom asked, my mom was hot, yeah. by the way. <laughs> my mom asked me, son, what does all this Hitler hullabaloo mean? Well, as my mom knows, I grew up a 98-pound weakling. In elementary school, Johnny Trzanowski beat me up regularly. In junior high school, Phil Keller took over for Johnny <laughs> Trasnowski and beat me up. In high school, Bob Newell took over for uh, Phil Keller and beat me up religiously. Uh, but somewhere between Bob Newell's beatings, I came to the conclusion, despite my best efforts and a relatively modest weight gain, that I would always remain low on the He-Man food chain. 
Trouble was, I really wanted to fight back. I'd pray every night, dear Jesus, please help me kick Bob Newell's ass. <laughs> it didn't work. Maybe Bob Newell prayed harder. Dear Jesus, please help me kick Riswold's ass more than I did today. But somewhere during Bob Newell's answered prayers, a couple things happened. I read some authors named UNESCO, Swift, and Voltaire. And I learned some new words, words like satire, sarcasm, sardonic wit, and hubris. And I discovered the absurdist wit of Monty Python. <laughs> I did some funny math. I've always been funny with math. I had to go to summer school in fourth grade to take math over. But I learned this something from this strange tonic of rhinoceroses, modest proposals, best of all possible worlds, and some very funny jokes about the very unfunny Spanish Inquisition. I learned to laugh at the bad guy. Now let's see in a little secret. Bad guys don't like to be laughed at. That's part of what makes them bad guys. They take themselves very, very seriously. However, we are told not to laugh at these people. Mocking them, laughing at them, satirizing them, we are told, trivializes their crimes. Obviously, I think I disagree. I would argue that only speaking about the Hitlers of the world in deadly serious tones actually pays the fools the reverence they so crave. They don't, be, they don't mind being called monsters, but they sure as fuck don't like being called fools. Voltaire said, quote, I have never made but one prayer to God, a very short one. O oh Lord, make my enemies ridiculous. Research says some good may come of doing so. Once I stopped, once I started mocking Bob Newell and his pugilist ways, he soon lost interest in beating me to a pulp. Go figure. But I think he stopped his bullying because I no longer paid him the reverence of fear. Yes, I thought it would make for an interesting, if not slightly offensive, story. Fake art saves my life. It would be perfect for Duke and the Dew Lectures until I got cancer again. I thought cancer was like dessert. You only got one. I thought wrong. My second bout with cancer started innocently enough with 18 gauge needles shoved up my ass. It would prove to be a trifle compared to how shall I put this? The adventures me and my ass and the rest of me would experience over the next few days. Those adventures would, would include, but were far limited to, two trips to the ER, one which included a three and a half hour stay on the floor of the ER, vomiting on a beautiful woman, a lost dog, Schrodinger's cat, getting two strains of E. coli, near asphyxiation, lots of blood, Keith Richards, cribbage, a four day stay in the hospital with a hillbilly roommate who liked his TV loud and is belching louder, being spoon-fed oatmeal by a beautiful woman clad in panties and six-inch heels, yes, the same one I had vomited on <laughs> earlier, and the start of my second tussle with cancer. It officially started on the fourth day in the hospital when Brian visited me and told me I had prostate cancer. In case you were wondering, only 1% of prostate biopsy patients get an infection. But as my good friend Melanie Myers told me, you'll do anything for attention. <clears throat> Others told me not to worry. My dad had prostate cancer and he still plays tennis. I fucking hate tennis. <laughs> prostate cancer is low rent cancer. I even convinced myself, you beat leukemia. This will be a piece of Adolf and Ava's wedding cake. It was decided the best course of treatment because I had an aggressive form in a later stage, would to be had to have my prostate removed. It was supposed to be a relatively simple surgery involving the Da Vinci robot. 
four little scars, some of them pleasant but short-term side effects, such as temporary urinary incontinence and impotence. In the latter's case, temporary meaning anywhere from three to 24 months. And me and my ass would be out of the hospital in a day. But not before some friends threw a going away party for my prostate. <laughs> anyway, back to the simple surgery. Things did not go according to plan. I had to put it mildly, to put it mildly, surgical complications, like almost dying. The night after my relatively simple surgery, I wake up in the middle of the night in the worst pain I have ever experienced. My abdomen was the size of two footballs. My heart rate was 170 over something. My, uh, my blood pressure was in the low 50s over something. They raced me to the ICU. I am bleeding to death internally a lot. Worst thing, I have to give up. Leave a hospital room so fancy it could have been featured in better homes and gardens. Long rail story short, the next 12 hours of my life include IVs, transfusions, injections, pick lines, oxygen masks, tubes down my throat, a whole lot of morphine that does nothing for the pain, hearing things such as, I can't get a pulse, an overeager eager cleaning lady, my parents in tears, the general chaos that goes on in the ICU trying to prevent someone such as myself from lapsing into a coma, and an overeager urology student who comes into my room and decides to fiddle with my catheter. The fiddling hurts despite all the morphine, and I, not, I, and I not so politely tell the student, I'm trying to lapse into a coma, and you're giving me a hand job? <laughs> anyway, after all this, they descend, decide to send me back to surgery. They removed nine liters of blood from my abdomen. They saved my life. A vein had been cut. I spent another week in the ICU feasting on popsicles and morphine while recovering from the second surgery. My body is a collection of unsightly bruises, staples, scars, tubes, bandages, catheters, and piping hot bags of piss. A friend says, I look like I swallowed a grenade. But I cheer myself up by reading about the carnage of World War I. I learn on July 1st, 1960, was the first day of the Battle of the Somme. That day is the bloodiest day in Britain's history. In the first hour of battle, they suffer almost 60,000 casualties, including almost 20,000 dead. Most of these casualties do come in the first hour. This is what happens when old generals and old tactics send young men charging into unprotected into modern weapons, such as entrenched machine guns and relentless military artillery fire. I learned that 20 million horses died during the First World War. So did a whole bunch of cows, ch camels, chickens, pigs, and sheep. Apparently, animals fare badly, if not worse, as m young men do against machine guns. I learned about the disillusionment of the common soldier. On March 13th, on March 3rd, 1960, during the Battle of Verdun, German expressionist painter Mark Franz Mark writes in his diary, for days I have seen nothing but the most terrible things that can be painted from a human mind. The next day he is dead. We've all learned to make jokes about the French army. Here's one. What do you call 100 Frenchmen, 100,000 Frenchmen with their hands up? The French army. I learned 1,397,800 ,300 French soldiers died, and over 4, 000, 4 million were wounded during the First World War, including 600,000 in the first eight months of the war. There is a damn good reason the French are war adverse. I learned about some special things that happened during this war. I learned about the Christmas truce 
of 1914, when British and German soldiers along the Western Front put down their weapons, climbed out of their mud-ridden trenches, met in no man's land, and sang Christmas carols, played soccer, exchanged gifts, and drank beer. A German soldier wrote, how marvelously wonderful yet strange it all was. The English felt the same way. Thus Christmas, the celebration of love, managed to bring mortal enemies together for friends for just the time. The next day, the British High Command said, anybody who does anything like that again will be court-martialed. I leave the hospital a mess, both physically and mentally, albeit a well-versed about World War I mess. All that cheery reading leads me to images that will form the basis of my upcoming show about World War I called The War to End All Wars That Fucked Up and Didn't End All Wars. And some of those images include <laughs> M. Weston Nick Noose, which is German for All Quiet on the Western Front. If you have not read that book, you should read that book. It is still relevant today. That's how you say All Quiet on the Western Front in French. The Quest Rin de Nouveau. Britain won, Germany nil. Don't shoot, I'm a cow. <laughs> French bread artillery. And keep your head down, Fritzy boy. These lyrics are taken from a songbook that was my grandfather's. He fought in the First World War. I'd like to thank him for surviving the First World War. Um, they gave him songbooks. Here, go to war, sing some songs. Absurd. Well, anyway, despite World War I's best intentions, things get worse when I wake up one morning after my piping hot bag of piss breaks during the night, and I am lying in a pool of my own urine and blood. I completely lose it. This is not what I signed up for. Brian and some other friends calm me down. I deal with it by having my good photographer and better friend, Ray Gordon, shoot my body in all its brokenness. Here comes the nude shots. In other words, I tell cancer the bully to go fuck himself. I lose the fear of what has happened to my body. I lose the fear of the side effects of temporary urinary continence and impotence, no, longer how, no matter how long that temporary may be. I lose the I lose my fear of the much longer recovery coming my way because of the second surgery. I lose my fear of cancer. Hell, let's go for a trifecta. Bring on a third, big boy. It also gives me optimism. It gives me the hope that my story and photos will give prostate cancer the attention it lacks, but deserves. Maybe it will get a baseball bat in its own special color, like the pink one. Trust me, it is not a second-rate cancer. It can rob a man both mentally and physically of his sexuality, just as breast cancer can a woman. It gives me the justified belief that is just, that <clears throat> just as unbelievably upside down extraordinary as my biopsy and surgery were, my sexual recovery will be every bit right side up extraordinary. In fact, I expect Nothing less than to utter Millard Fillmore and get an erection the size of his home state of New York. <laughs> it would only be fair. Millard Fillmore, all together with me now. Millard <laughs> Fillmore, louder please. Millard Fillmore. I think it moved, thank you. 